is a faith-based uh, institution. And therefore, we put God at the center of all our activities. I would therefore like to invite uh, Reverend Dr. Andy to say the opening prayer. Our great God in heaven, we thank you so much today. We thank you for your love, your grace, your guidance. We thank you so much for today, the day that you have given out to us, to listen to yet another inspiring lecture. Lord, we thank you for the life of the university. We are so grateful to have Vice Chancellor the management to pilot the face of the university for the glory of their name. May your speaker give us that which is from you, and may he inspire us to do more and do more for that glory sake. That was the Reverend Doctor and he is the Dean College of Arts.
that company. And he's done a very unique thing. He has brought the whole company to sit with us here today. He's the chairman who will be speaking to us, his wife, who is also part of the company, then other directors, including Chief David Amo, there is also General Aila. There is also Engineer Yusuf, Director of the Company. And the Engineer Yusuf is here with his wife, Professor Mrs. Yusuf. Very unique. Thank you. Especially the traditional rulers. I don't want to tell you the story of how they came to be here in the numbers they are. But it's a recognition of their respect for the guest lecturer and for their respect of what is happening at the University of Ghana, I would really, really, really thank you. Engineer, Gazara is somebody who is very, very unique. I wish I had known him when he was chopping grass. <laughs> I missed going to Mount St. Michael's earlier. Maybe if I went to Mount St. Michael's, I would have had the privilege of meeting him. I couldn't. My father was a very poor man, so he decided to send me to a government college, Katsunana, which at that time was a better school than Mount St. Michael's earlier. <laughs> My worry is this lecture being a very relevant lecture and with many proportions. I would have expected a whole larger, twice this size, to trade for five miles as a small boy from the house to the primary school. They wouldn't believe me. When I sent them down to travel to my house to the general junction to buy recharge cards, they asked for transport money. I said, you are lucky. <laughs> Those days, my father would take a whip. If I was late in school, I received a punishment. But those were the good old days. Most of our friends, our brothers, who have made it to the top, never regretted what they went through. In fact, it was a blessing. Today, it is a blessing that one of them one of those pioneer people who started from grass and have reached the top, the pinnacle of their chosen profession and career, is here with us, free of charge, to come and tell us what it takes. I hope some of you who not only record uh, speeches and rumors at political rallies will also open your phones and record what it's going to say. As for me, Providence had descended on me to chairman this occasion. I was coming here to sit there and listen attentively and at the end ask some topical questions. But here the man, and this is also a lesson. I wasn't coming here to chairman this occasion. The chairman of any event is a very big man of <laughs> Some chairmen are now being asked to vacate their position so that another person will be appointed as a chairman. True or false? <laughs> yes, am I? <laughs> being called for without any application to chairman. I thank the vice chancellor. 
and the distinguished senior officials of the university, dean, heads of department, professors, and uh, I sincerely appreciate the royal fathers that are with me, that came to honor this occasion. I will start from my team, who actually, when I was talking to him, he volunteered and, uh, to keep me company. In fact, he said he would lead my delegation. So he was very, very willing. Then I went to my two colleagues, whom I went to pay homage. We talked about so many other things, we didn't talk about this. But the next day, he called me and uh, said he was going to be present. Then I started to realize that this is a main event for my day, for my two twenty to volunteer to be here. The topic, actually, I started getting closely related to Professor Gundu when I went for my doctorate degree from the Commonwealth University, and that was supervised and managed by Professor Yune. So uh, we got closer contact with, with the Vice Chancellor. And then sometime last year, he led a delegation of chief professionals to Lagos. I think they were going to see General Passenger. And then they came to Lagos to see, have a chat with us as one of the leaders of, of, of chief community in Lagos. And we had some important discussions, bordering on unity and love within Team Land. And then after that, we got closer and we started communicating between ourselves. And then sometime last year, he extended this invitation to me. And uh, I'd like to schedule these invitations. You don't want to, you know, I have just had a public outing. So I said, I will attend to it maybe towards the end of the year. And then uh, we now looked at it. I couldn't just come in November. And then we decided that since I was coming home for New Year, we'll combine everything. And here we are today. So I appreciate all of you. I appreciate my football team, all of you. So I'll go straight to it. So when he invited me for it, I have no choice but to 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 accept. And uh, as it turned out, I thought it would be a very simple thing because I was going to talk about myself. So it was when I got back for my holidays that I decided to put pen on paper. Uh, that was on the twenty on, on the thirty first. But I started putting pen on paper. And to do a thorough job, you just, you, it ended up taking quite some time. Because if you are going to talk about yourself, it can't be too shallow. You have to go deep enough. You have to go deep enough, some depth, for people to appreciate the details. So it's not, like I said earlier, it's not just an introduction. It's like a, a case study. So, so it took us some time, but by yesterday we put what we, we had to put together. And I hope you find it beneficial. The Kassara story from grass to grace. For me, I, I decided to take it in two layers. First, to tell you my story. Nice, simple, straightforward story. And the second bit, to pick out lessons from this story that you can take back. It's all well and good to hear my story, but perhaps it's better to take something back. So, I'll split the story into two. I have the story itself, and then the second part of it is highlighting the lessons you can get from it. 
I didn't want to combine the two. If I'm telling you the story, I'm bringing out the lessons at first, it will look a little bit confusing. So I start with my background. Everybody has got a foundation. And I'll just read, and then at the end of the paragraph, any important highlights, I'll bring it out. I'm glad to be here today to share my authentic life stories and hope that at least a few people will pick something from it. I have always wanted to play some role in raising business people in our state. But past effort did not yield desired results. Now, I see this lecture as a theoretical attempt at the same thing. I sincerely hope that somebody will learn from my experience. A lot of our younger ones, you want to nurture them, you want to encourage them, you want to support them to do business. Or you start up a small business, by the time they see 10, 15 million, they, they would rather take it than know that we can plow this part into a business and within two years or so, you will get more than that. And that has been in my experience. I've tried that very many times. There was a time, many of you from Madiko know that I had a, a cooperative society. I would put money there. We were serious about it. I was coming two times a year to sit and talk with these people. But whoever was in charge of money, he sat from the money. So practically, it has not been possible for me. But I believe this is a theoretical aspect of that. And I want to also believe too that hopefully in another year or two, I want to address that. The aspect of nurturing business people in the state. It's a life ambition for me. You know, uh, uh, it's a business that has made me who I am. And I would like to impact on other people. So it's a life ambition. The journey of life and how successful an individual is, is always determined by many factors. Why submitted to the top by circumstances of faith, because they were born with silver spoon, I came from a humble background. I am viewed as being successful by act of providence, but with deed of hard work, discipline, and dedication in the career path I found myself. Some are born with silver spoon, so things are easy. But some of us have to work to get to where we are. Sometimes I marvel when people say, quote me as being successful. For me, it's just a stepping stone. I'm still looking forward to going up and up and up. So, and, so that is it. Thank you. I am Silvanus Chi Awaji Gasara. Silvanus has to do with, uh, if you check that, my father used to tell me Savala. So, so it's like the god of grasslands. It's, it's like a Roman god of grasslands, savanna area. She is the name my parents gave me. I don't know the meaning. Awaji is like the name of my earthly father. And Gasara is the name of my grandfather. Actually, Gasara was taught to have been a returning slave. He was said to have been dropped around the Calabar uh, area. But he walked, went into the hinterland. At that time, the southwest part of Cameroon was part of Nigeria. So he went up, when he went to the Bermuda Plateaus, he found the weather very good, very peaceful, just like just Plateau. So he settled there. He put big land as he settled there. That name, Gasara, is very unique. There is no Gasara anywhere we know. Not in Cameroon, not in Nigeria. But I suppose we are attached to that name 
because it was said to be very successful. All the children are attached to that name. Nobody wants to change from that name to his own father's name. So he is my grandfather. So, now, I was born on the 6th of October, incidentally at Mkan here. As, so I'm coming back to my roots in a way, as the first child of my parents. This was at the time my father was serving as a teacher and had just been transferred from Korea to Mbappe. My father had actually, let me just take it. I was born in the hospital and my father moved with me to the compound of Mr. Awaji. My wife earlier, if you go to paragraph four, my father Michael Gasara had completed his primary school in 1935. And he served a reverend father in Calabar. He was diligent in his duties. And in 1943, the Reverend Father recommended him to the Reverend Father in Korea. Even though he did all the primary school, that he should go and help in teaching. And at that time, he was a teacher and also doing uh, uh, this cat case. He was like a cat case. So, so that was the time that Catholicism was spreading northwards from Calabar into Tivla. NKST had come much earlier, but the Catholics came around that period. After about three years in Korea, my father went back to Sotra to marry my mother, Maria. And they were in Korea for about two years when he served before being transferred to Shangri He helped Mr. Mr. Awaji had asked that he wanted to establish a school at Mbappe. In fact, the village itself, in a small community itself, was called Awaji. Later, it merged with Mbappe and that. So, so my father came there and established St. Joseph Primary School. Now it is known as St. Martin's Nursery and Primary School, and it's waxing stronger to this day. That school is there to this day. I am, so my third name is Awaji, and we have maintained, while my father was a teacher, we have maintained close relationship with the Awaji family. This morning, as I came, I saw one of my brothers, Mr. Ishida Awaji. Are you in the world? Thank you, my brother. Thanks. That's, that's one of the Awaji family. While my mother was a teacher at the disciplinarian, my mother was a very respectful, hardworking and supportive wife. She came to Gogo in 1955 to learn how to sew machine for nine months and returned to Adipo as the first female seamstress. She trained women like Mrs. Zohar, Mrs. Dambua Zohar, who is actually Peter Zohar's mother, and Mrs. Bernard, and we grew up with some of their children as brothers, so we, are, we, see, we all interrelate. I talk about my parents because one's foundation is important. I call that lesson one. When I finish, we will bring that out so that you can pick that point. Your foundation is important. Page three, my education. At about age five, my parents moved with me, like I said earlier, to Shangri-La. Moved with me from shangri to Adipo, where I grew up and attended St. Anne's Catholic Primary School and finished in 1962. I attended Marcel St. and Yede, 63 to 67. After secondary school, one thing led to the other, and I found myself in Jones. Within a week of getting to Jones, I was admitted to School of Mines for a two-year di diploma program in mining. Turned out that the Sheikh Atelier prepared me to my 
destined, the distinct profession. So, basically, there was an issue at a lady, and those of us who finished our secondary school and were doing HSC, you know, there is, when you stay in secondary school and you are doing HSC, it was like three months into our HSC. So we were asked to like spare head that problem. And the problem went up and uh, we were told to come and get letters from our father and those from this side, a recommendation from Toti. And then the Doma chaps were told to do the same and bring to school before they would take us back. And uh, I know that if I went and told my father that I had issues at that level, he would beat the hell out of me. He, would, he doesn't spare the rod. For that, I'd rather go to just because they had just created just by then. So I left for just. It was a bit of a shocking, but they came up as some kind of blessing in disguise. So, but before that, before that, there's something I want to say about my father. He was a very strict disciplinarian. I'm sure some, some of the older ones went to Mount Saint, to St. Anzadibo. He used to be in charge of late commas. He used to be in charge of late commas. So he was strict disciplinarian. But this man had some foresight. He had some foresight. He would go to the villages, recruit people, bring them in. And I can remember when I went to UK, I went to UK for my uh, degree program in 1977. When I came back, I came back, my first visit to Adipo was 80, 81. So, my father called me and told me that by then, the, the southwest part of Cameroon had decided to join their French brothers. So, they parted away. So, he told me that even though he has been accepted by our community, he decided to formally apply for Nationalization. I was surprised. I was surprised that he had so much foresight. At that time, somebody of just class seven thinking of something like that. And he brought out the papers and he had been pursuing it at the Ministry of Internal Affairs to a level. You know. So I just took I just took a copy of the papers. Apparently, as I went back to Lagos, within two or three weeks, I spoke to a friend of mine, uh, late uh, Raphael Opa, and Raphael Opa told me that any time, actually I was at Ilori, so he told me any time I'm in Lagos, I should come with those papers. When I was in Lagos, I came with it. Raphael took me to Simon Shango, then secretary, he was the secretary of, of PDP then, or FPN. He was the secretary of FPN. When Simon Sarko saw it, the papers had been, been processed like two years and were stopped. Simon took it up, put up a letter to the Minister of Internal Affairs, and within about six months after that, my father got his naturalization officially, dated 1983. So I just bring that example out to show you how, how I would say, uh, what foresight, you know, because most people will just sit back and just take it easy. He has been accepted, he has been integrated with the society, but he took a step, which even me today was, was something amazing. So I just brought that point out to, to highlight something. So I'll move to section C. 
After graduation in 1970, from School of Mines, I went to School of Mines just. By then, the Civil War was on, and the technocrats in the mining industry, who are mainly Igbos, went back. So there was a gap. So they were doing this two-year program, like a degree. When you finish, they paid us very well, better than degree holders. You know, so, uh, so I now quickly got a job with Bisichi, with Janta. Where Benue State was created, I looked for jobs. I started to explore for jobs elsewhere. And I got a job with Nigeria Explosives and Plastic Company in Lagos. During the one I had, that's lesson three. We'll tackle that later. During the one I had years employment with Nepo, I supplied explosives for the construction of Lagos in Panama Expressway. That was the time that that road was opened up, the dual carriageway. Before, it was one meandering road from Lagos through Ikorodu, meandering Shangamu, you know. But this expressway was opened up that I supplied the road, the explosives for that. And that was at the age of 28. So it was a very major assignment at that young age. So even though I was doing well relatively, the desire for further education was still burning in me. So at that time, once you qualify, once you have your, your grades, there were, there were no issues getting scholarship. Government was willing to give scholarships. You just needed to apply. And when I went, so I had a scholarship even while I was in jobs. But I was, you know, when you are comfortable, and most of my classmates that finished school of mine said, what am I going to do for, with a degree? I'm being paid, and I'm treated well. They give you a fine house, and you, you know the way the team minds work. So, but when I went to Lagos, my interaction with the Yorubas, where everybody wants to go overseas. So, but I just started looking at it. Well, I have my, degree, my scholarship. I just needed to go to the ministry and upgrade it, up, dust it up, because it had, it had expired the year before. But you went to the ministry and you didn't use it. At that time, they will, they will renew it for you. So with that, I went to university. I went to, specifically, I went to Cardiff, University of Wales. On graduation in 1980, I got a job with the Imperial Chemical Industries in the UK, which was one of the top, big, the top 30 biggest companies in the world. I worked there briefly, and later they posted me back to Nigeria with their subsidiary called CAPL. CAPL if you see, like the cell pens, medicines, if you remember medicines those days with ICI on it. So I got a job with them, with ICI is the parent company of CAPL. Later, around 1992, I think it was the IBB government introduced SAP. And many foreign companies were not comfortable with SAP because they feel, you know, that that uh, it doesn't provide environment, a conducive environment, particularly for African countries. So I said I wanted to withdraw their, their partnership. It was a 40% ICR, 60% Nigeria relationship, partnership. So I said I wanted to withdraw. And a lot of us were not comfortable with that. And many staff left, I left, and uh, uh, while I was there, Israel Yusuf, who is my director, was my number two. So when I left, he took over my position as HOD. I was managing. So uh, that is it. So when I returned as CAPL in 1982, I made it now. Section D is the start of the business. Section D, D1. I take D1 from 1987 to 92. When I resumed as CAPL in 1982, I made it a habit to save part of my salary on a monthly basis. I can recall that each month, when I got my pay, I would keep a certain percentage. 
I know people talk about 10%, but I think I was doing something like 12 to 15 percent. I would take it to the bank. At that time, it was savings account. You have to queue, they will take it as stamp on your card. And I was doing that religiously. So, so after about eight years, I was comfortable enough to start up a small business. I had considerable savings, and I was comfortable enough. I was able to achieve this through self-discipline, a sticky drive and a strong economic status through righteous means. So, having said that, even before that, I had come to Makadi because I was working at an organization. I had come to Makadi to encourage people that who can key in to CAPL and the distributors. I had come looked at it. You know, that time there were not many businessmen. I remember even talking to uh, Cisco, Mr. Simon Shedu, a couple of people to encourage them. But a few, the few businessmen in Bakodi then were more, they found it easier to be distributors of various men. Once various men come, they turned around or whatever. So they didn't show much interest. So that, that is what prompted me to actually try to do it myself. So I registered my, this company, Nika M, in July 1987. And after eight years of savings, I had 155,000 naira in two accounts in September 1987. I was ready to kickstart the business. We acquired a brand new Pigeon 404 pickup for 32,585 naira. And it was delivered to Makuti at the cost of 550 naira. I have the invoices and the receipts. So you can see how your, your naira has gone down. You know, that was in 1987. So the total cost was 33,100 naira. I paid 100,000 naira to CAPM for supply of pegs and agrochemicals. The business started relatively big with bad fare as we rented the store and office of 42 Park Road, Makodi. Later, we even moved to a bigger office on uh, Boko Road. Mr. Peter Zohar was our chairman. From my assessment, I think the management was defective, so the business did not do well. Our returns were in the negative. Purchases were hardly paid, and expenses exceeded income. You can imagine any business that expense exceeded income, you can you can make it. So the business went down. By end of financial year 1980, 1991, net value of stocks was down to only 38,810 naira, with no capacity to replenish the stocks. So that was, I call that the making of the beginning. Usually, in everything, before you do something properly, there are preambles. You have been playing with certain things. So this, I call this space, I wasn't the one managing, I call this space the making of the beginning. The beginning for me was 1992, when I left CAPL to start. So we're now on page five, for those of you who have this, we want to go through so that we can take questions, we can make it interactive, you know, and uh, we can address the lessons. As earlier stated, thank you very much. As earlier stated, the introduction of SAP in the, in the economy led to my resignation from CAP. After serving as marketing manager, I head of the department for 10 years. My retirement was predicated on my intention to do for myself that which I have done to add value to the corporate organizations I had worked for. I used my retirement benefit plus savings to start a new business. 
Thank you very much. I think I think uh, you are lecturers, so you pick from my voice that I probably did this. Give me a minute. So, uh, <clears throat> so I use my retirement benefit as part of my service to start a new business in the profession. I placed my first order from of industrial chemicals. For you, the layman, we call it industrial chemicals. For we going closer to the to the issues, we call it ammonium nitrate. This is an ammonium nitrate. It was three containers of ammonium nitrate. Actually, the goodwill I generated with ships, a French company based in here in Lagos, facilitated the order as they did the order on my behalf. It was 33, 54 metric tons, 18 metric tons per container, at USD 375 USD per ton, with a total value of USD 20,250. Plus clearing and everything, it was delivered and I had a Naira invoice of 251797 And it's definitely, like I said there, the goodwill helped me a lot. Yeah, the goodwill helped me a lot because when I wanted to retire, I told a number of people a month or two before, and the MD of SIP said, wow, because we have been using them to buy chemicals for by the company CAPL. And he, 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 trusted, he, he, he trusted in my abilities and my integrity. So he said, look, we'll help you. We'll help you. So whatever money we had, we dropped it with him. He ordered it. And, and at the end of the day, processed everything and gave it also. There were some credit factors in it. The consignment arrived in June. And I contacted the clearing agent to clear the goods for me. It was Abraham Tule. Some of you, this is his hometown. Abraham Tule was the clearing agent, and I contacted him to help me clear. So it was stored in my garage at 20, that, that's my house. Within two months, it was sold, and I placed another order of five containers for the same chemical. By the time this one came, I had gotten a small warehouse to put it. So, um, Taking that to the end, I encountered teaching problems, of course, of setting up the company, and I navigated through them by building resilience capacity. Section D. So you have a lesson seven there, which I'll trash later. Section D, D3. This is the rough, stormy weather. The first five years here was very good. In fact, I built my first house in Computer Village during that first five years. And I bought land. I was, by that time, a lot of my brothers were moving to Abuja. So I bought land in Asokoro for my second property in the, within the first five years. Then the stormy weather came. Generally, the business was good in the first five years. When the major supplier of nitrate to Nika came sold out that line of business. So they sold out that line of business to some other people. And this new set of people did want any credit. They insisted on 100 percent payment, 100 percent upfront payment. And I think I've been used to pay maybe 30, 40 percent to SIPs. See who add a bit of money moving to like 60, 70 percent, and the parent company in France will give credit. So they will give seeds credit, and seed will extend that credit to me. I've been used to that. I've been making whatever profit I had, I put some in the business, and some of that of the properties during that first five years that I built. Then, when the credit stopped, the monies I had, it's not only five containers now, we're only probably able to do three containers. So my capacity to perform went down from whatever it is to maybe only 60%. So it's like a decline. So uh, we have to pay 
100% upfront for goods. So the company went through some turbulent period. We had to look for ways of injecting money to meet up with the payment terms. Yes. This helped to stabilize the business for some time. Till the fateful day of 15 January 2002, when a truck carrying the, our products got exploded in root Abuja, killing six people in the process. This was a big blow to the business as we used a lot of our money to provide compensation. So that, that early January, there was acute scarcity of petrol in Nigeria. So we loaded our goods, somebody desperately needed it. We loaded our goods, and I think Ejira Yogo accompanied those goods. Ejira Rex. Rex, you accompanied those goods, and we took, they took fuel and put it at the back of the car, because there was no fuel. And the silencer of the vehicle was touching the body of the vehicle. But they didn't know. So it was touching the body of the vehicle. And heat from the silencer got it warm, got the vehicle warm, and the, the, the cherry car that they were carrying the petrol melted. And the petrol started leaking. The petrol was leaking. They were in front driving. They did not know that the petrol was leaking. Suddenly it was leaking on the silencer. You can see how accidents happen. It was taken on the silencer. And as they were going suddenly, they saw it caught fire. It caught fire and there are explosives in the truck. And the fuel and uh, the fuel and the fire got the temperature to a certain level that the explosives exploded. In the meantime, when the fire came up, people ran, but the, the local villagers were trying to help. When they saw the truck fire, they were carrying sand to pour, and they were just trying to help. And it exploded as six people died. So we got there, we did everything we could do to pacify them. And, uh, and later, the local community, they say, well, it's an act of God. There's nothing they could do, and all that and all that. But I, I insisted, I insisted that we do the right thing. So the little money we had, we had to divert. I said, we must pay compensation. So we, we put ourselves a certain fee, and we pay. It wasn't one off. We paid gradually over phases. And within six months, at least, you know, we paid something to the, to the uh, dependents. Though life cannot be replaced or adequately compensated, we did a little bit to provide succor to the bereaved families. Generally, it was a dark period in the life of the company, but we managed on as prudently as possible. And then there is a lesson there, lesson seven. We will look at that towards when we finish. The hard times made me embark on search for partnership with manufacturers. That really brought us down. It really, really, really brought us down. So I now decided to start looking for partnership. And it started with a, a scan through the internet for manufacturing of explosives. I paid a businessman. Scan through, you got a list of all over the world, just get everybody that is with explosives. They got the list. I think that first time, 30 there we asked for Europe, because by then we were dealing mostly with European companies. So I asked for look for Europe, but Western Europe would be expensive. So I said, look for Eastern Europe. So we got, so uh, eventually. We zeroed down to a few companies. We, we expressed our interest to deal with them. We got the invitation. Eventually, I went on a tour to Poland and Bulgaria. The result of the search was a partnership collaboration with a company called Neutron SA. 
This Nitro SA is a Polish government company. In Eastern Europe, the government owned companies. So, uh -huh. they manufacture NG based explosives. After the first order, they gave us credit. In fact, when I went there, I was the first black man to come to that factory. Very huge factory. So they took my picture. They did, we related very well, you know. So in fact, people were coming to look at me because the whole town is built on the factory. It's a huge factory with people, you know, NG, NG explosives. You need to because it's a very dangerous chemical. You need spec to space. When you put a unit here, you need to go a certain distance before you put a unit, so that if one there is an accident in one building, it will just explode without affecting the other building. So, so anyway, we, we dealt with them, and then later they increased my facility to one fifty thousand dollars. We processed about five others from Neutron SA before 2004. So the next stage now, we were dealing with Detroit SA, uh, then this opportunity now came, which is D4, which I call it the recovery and stability. Are they, do you have, Ray, do you have enough of this? Is it enough? Wait. You have enough? Oh, it's down the way. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. okay. So early in 2004, a Ghanaian called Kofi Adam Amao was working as a consultant with a company called Mola in Nepada. He contacted Ishmael Yogo to introduce him to me. Yogo, I think by then you were doing a uh, you were, were you with us or you were on your own? You were deep yes. of the nigga again. Okay. So, he contacted the general Joko to introduce him to, or to me. So, he then took, we talked and he came, then he introduced an in German solar explosive. We developed the discussion and he requested that. We should open an LC on him before he will take his commission and pay solar. So we were first, that was the first time we were talking about Indian products, and I wasn't sure the type of quality they had. But after persuasion, getting this, the, the, the data page and all that, I decided to take that risk. Because it's a bit of a risk to open an LC on somebody that you don't know. We were not opening the first LC on solar. We wanted to open directly on solar. But he said, you have to open it on me in Ghana so that he can take his commission. So we did that. This product came in June 2004, the first product. And we sold it quickly. And we placed another order through the same system of four containers. This second order impressed the India manufacturers that we, within if, if, uh, two, three months, we were able to place another order. And they scheduled to visit Nigeria. The MD of Solar, Mr. Manish, came around October, and we had a tour of the country. At that time, they were developing Obajana and Nimco, the Nigeria mining and uh, the iron something at uh, Ajakota. When they saw that the prospects were very promising, so he, he now gave us credit for supply to these companies of two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Paragraph two of D four, paragraph three. We used the credit effectively and performed well. As the product was good, the product was good. Initial attempt to penetrate European companies were difficult as they believed that Indian products were not good enough. We pushed on with the product at better pricing. This 
is that Asia products like India and China are usually cheaper than European products because of cost of labor, cost of manufacturing. So we pushed through and then uh, we went to Chilos Belgium. I remember when we went to Chilos Belgium, the first comment the people said is something like, Get, go away with Indian rubbish. That's what they say. I'm sure Nika Kemp staff have heard that story. Rex, you are here? Yeah, they said, they said take, take your Indian rubbish away. We were trying to introduce that. And we came up, put our hands together, and I took a decision that tell them, give them 10 tons of explosive, supervise the blasting. If it doesn't work, they should not pay. And they asked us to put it in writing. And we wrote and confirmed it. And Rex was the person who supervised it. They blasted. When it came off, it was fantastic. They could not believe it. So that was a major breakthrough for us. Because, I mean, they are used to getting prices, products from Europe. And here they are, getting Indian products, maybe at that time 30, 40 percent cheaper. And the impression of India, India or China, some of you will remember most people were the Europeans, uh, the documented us. The thing that it is from China or India was second class. So it was fantastic. So once we got to Australia, we only needed to tell others that JP has bought. Also, after two supplies, Julius Pleasure was satisfied with the product and quantity of service. They offered to pay in advance so as to secure their product. Julius Pleasure is a very organized company. They are very, very organized. Once they have confidence in you, they will pay in advance. They ask you to keep a store for them. You bring their goods and keep for them. They don't take, then they will be drawing down. They will be drawing down that they make a big order give you maybe 50, 60 percent payment. Once you confirm that the, that it's going to be shipped, the palace, they pay you straight away. So they were paying up front. Good price, and they were paying up front. And this helped us a lot. So when Sola gave us credit for six months, we paid off within three months. And all the months we had, we put it in place on that. So some of them were very impressed that we are meeting our credit terms. Sola then saw us as a reliable customer and invited us in 2008 for talks on partnership because we performed very well. Then came the negotiations. That's lesson 11. The last paragraph on that page 6. The, nego the negotiations were not straightforward and lasted for quite some time with lawyers, maybe maybe legal department, because it was very deep, took a lot of time. We met both in Lagos, we met in India, I went to India two times, they came here many times. And uh, breakthrough came when I visited India with Chief David Amo. That was when the breakthrough came. And what was it all about? We were negotiating for controlling shares. That was what we were negotiating. Everybody wanted to have a control. We felt it's our country. It's in Nigeria, so we should have more. They felt they have the factory, they have the technology, so they should do, get more. Those were the, that was the key aspect of the negotiation. When we went with Chief David Amo, finally we he looked at it, we looked at it together, and we reflected. And uh, I remember Chief said that which is better? You want to have a big percentage of a small thing? Do you want to be sold all of your business, have a 90% of maybe something doing 50, 50 units, or a smaller percentage of a big thing. 
That's the big thing. That's the big, the critical question. So when we looked at it, since this board, we started partnering with them. Our uh, financial status has improved. Our uh, profitability has improved. So why can't you accept what's on the table? Finally, we looked at it and we settled and we agreed with the partners on a workable uh, ratio. So after that, once we agreed there, measure process started. The measure process started with due diligence on the company, which involved scrutinizing everything that you had. The brother law firm took a meeting book, took all our bank statements, looked at everything, and made recommendations to their partners. And then, and then all the business, and ended with signing of the partnership agreement and shareholders agreement. Like I said, it's a very digital thing. And uh, what can do a case study on that, quite frankly? But at the end of the day, when the people looked at our books, they said everything they saw is kept very well. And that is very important because when you start fiddling with certain things you don't keep to the law, it, it has a telling on you. So there is a lesson there that will take that, that will be lesson two. So we are now on page seven. Soon after signing the agreement, on the 28th of March 2008, we moved quickly to acquire land for the factory. I spearheaded that and went there by then. Myself and Alaji Yusuf, who was my number two, both of us went. Later, I withdrew. I was concentrating on some things, and Alaji Yusuf really, really, really worked on the land and uh, worked on the I think I can start talking about that gym because we really did a good job with the man. Uh, we got 250, 250 uh, acres of land, which is 100 hectares. And for back of me, I'm uh, awarding local government of Ogo State negotiations for the land in Ogo State presented a lot of challenges through which we developed many beneficial interpersonal relationships with key personalities amongst the host community and local state technocrats. It took us quite, quite a long time, but after one and a half years of serious work, land was acquired and things moved very quickly. Equipment was imported and moved to site. Uh, EGC, EGC, and battery was ready. During this time, we had unlimited credit, and our business grew by over 30 percent. By grew by 30 percent over the preceding year. So, even though we are not, they have not been on site because the agreement was when was to start when the factory starts. But even though the factory had not started, they gave us credit. They gave us almost unlimited credit. And the company was doing very well at that time. Then, then the factory was there. On this page, you see some pictures. You see some pictures of this page. You see uh, that's the page to the factory. Yeah. That's the first picture is the page to the factory. The second picture is the factory office. Factory office. The picture here is one of the Dixie units when we born. And uh, the fourth picture on the right is one of the uh, machines that they use. And all this is part of the mixing. All this is an overview, the last picture is an overview of the manufacturing process and the, and the cartridge and the rest of it. The table below shows the recorded production figures of high explosives from inception to 2000, in 2011 to 10. So uh, those are the figures. This will give you a yearly. After the first year, we, we pick every three, three years. You can see there that there's a steady growth of the business. You can see a steady growth of the business. 
Um, we can refer you to our website where you can get more details. You can get the details there. So having made it, or now that things were looking better, we are moving to section E, which is giving back to the society. And I say I'm, a bas I'm basically a down-to-earth simple person who would like to relate with the so-called common man. I recall that even when I was doing sales, sometimes you, you travel a lot, you sleep in a three or four star hotel, but I would like to stop by the roadside and eat with the local community. I just stop and eat. So I like to relate with the, the, the local people. And I, and I also like to make an input. I, I like to make an input wherever I am, whatever it is, whatever, anywhere I can be of use. That's my nature. So I like to make an input into, to, to, to contribute my little quarter. So I believe in contributing my bit in uplifting the society. And I do this directly or through my foundation, which is the Sonoros Kassara Foundation. I, would, I just list three activities recently that I'm on, which is highly appreciated. We have a number. The first one there is the Kwadi Nika Kemp. Kwadi Nika Kemp stand up. We have been sponsoring this team since Coach Miro, since about one year. 2010. 2010. We have been sponsoring them since 2010. I started that before the measure. And when we did the measure, my people said we should continue with it. So at that point, you can see that they are just representing, we are taking, we are taking care of 25 people, and we'll be keeping them since then. 30. 30. I think even recently, uh, two months ago, once in a while we get them to go to Lagos so that uh, they would not be personal touch. I think two months ago or something, it was in November. A month ago. Huh? A month ago. A month ago. A month ago. They came to Lagos to play football with the Liga Camp team itself. We have another team that the workers have as part of recreation. They came and we just they spent three, four days and we take care of them, stay in the hotel, enjoy themselves. And after that, I had a dinner for them in my house. So, so that, that is a Liga Camp responsibility. That was Liga Camp. Uh, two, day, two, two years back, two, three years back, I impact on my efforts to improve electricity in my hometown. I provided four 500 kV transformers, transmit cables, poles, and accessories, and I think this is very well appreciated by my community. Very, very well appreciated. I didn't know that time I was just doing it. That costed me about that costed me 24, almost 24, close to 25 million. That project costed me about 20, close to 25 million. But it's important to me. Even the last two, three days in Adibo, the light is there and it's working. It's working. So we are enjoying it. Uh, it's not perfect, but we'll see how things work, you know. Uh, number three, I have an NGO support the childless in quite a local government. I give them a small amount, not a small amount, and they appreciate it. Back at home, Small amount, eight to ten thousand, and they appreciate. And uh, I have one fifty-eight childless people in Atibo, and fifty in Ajio. That D six, I was talking about the fact that when we join the League of Resist Manufacturers, it sets some shock waves in the industry. Our ultra modern emotion explosive factory was completed, and we start we test run it on thirtieth. April 2011. That's when we test run the factory. And uh, I thought it was better. In fact, I invited my mother, she's the one that opened it, to appreciate her for the discipline, the discipline she brought me 
So my brother played the role there. The explosive plant has a combined capacity of all that 30,000 metric tons and all that and all that. Creepy plant. After that factory, with every year or two, they are additional. So it's not just it's not just explosive. It's a complex. It's an explosive complex. We have a whole range of products that we are manufacturing. We are manufacturing detonators, and in addition to that, we have ampo, ammonium nitrate premix. We bring ammonium nitrate in. Ampo serves a role between normal explosive and high explosive. It serves a middle class role. So that is also being met. So uh, we say here that my company thus became the second local, second local manufacturer of civil explosives with aggregated production capacity to meet and service the various explosive needs. The supply for mining, quarrying and construction, oil and gas, added capacity to supply the West African sub region. We are currently operating at 75% of installed capacity. And then our strategy and all that. And even right here, we are supplying the investment of explosives, you know, and uh, so, so that's that. So G7, in 2013, apart from the global pandemic, and after that lockdown due to COVID, so the pandemic, most companies have had financial challenges during that time. But apart from that, we also had a very, a very great, a very turbulent period experience. But by the grace of God, God saw us through that challenge. A 10 ton truck carrying explosives caught fire and explosive exploded around Akure. This time, no life was lost. But a lot of buildings were damaged. We were more organized this time around. That first time that we had the accident, the people came and they saw that we were a small company. And quite frankly, they even told us, well, it's God, it's God, let's just bury the people. But we said no. We will do the burial. We will pay money for all their burial. But we will also give the dependent something. You know, that's what we did. But this time around, it was no life was lost, and it was just the damages, buildings that were damaged. So I'm saying here that we are more organized. I had insurance come. The insurance paid compensation valued at about 380 million naira to the affected people. The Ugu state government were involved. My, all my staff were all involved in the Southwest, and uh, Israel Yusuf went to supervise. I went there. Maureen was very involved, my daughter, and uh, we paid compensation. We supervised that. And at the end of the day, we developed very good relationship with state government and the people because they saw that justice was done. Now, the last paragraph there is in 2000. Uh, 2020, we took the bold step. This is now post factory. I call it post factory grade three. There was the first one was post factory grade one. Uh, grade one, grade one. I keep it to the VCs adjectives of talking about grace because at this time we are operating, we are more comfortable. So the first one was grace. Uh, Grace 1, the second stage was Grace 2, where we had all our plants, ampho units, uh, the Toledo Creepy plant, the factories there were supply cement companies. This G7 from 2002, we took the first step of exporting our products. So I call it post factory Grace 3. Because at that level, that it becomes like a major achievement. Because a few years earlier, we were predominantly importing 100%. For the first time, the company is able to export their products in Nigeria. 
So government was very, very comforting, very appreciative. And uh, so in 2020, yeah, so in 2020, we took the bold step of exporting our products. And our first export of one container was sent to Ghana. This year, the, that last year, I was writing this probably two days ago, but my brain is saying this year, <laughs> last year, we exported to Benin Republic, Ghana, and Cameroon, while receiving inquiries from Togo, Gambia, and Burkina Faso. I think it's like, I think it's like Yoga was delayed because he was staying back to supervise the export of material. I don't know what country you are doing. Is it Togo or Ghana? I don't know. Niger. Where? Niger. Niger. So he was staying back and uh, I didn't expect that he would come and actually excuse him. But in fact, he can take off to three days and honor this occasion. We are consolidating the present and planning for the future expansion to adequately cover West Africa. So in Grace 3, we are actually working in, let me say, in, in a bit of a comfort zone. Last year, we, when I looked at the figures, 15 our revenue in terms of foreign currency was about 15% of our import. 15%. Within two years of export, you can get 15% in dollar of what you spend to import. That is a very good achievement. That's a very good achievement. And uh, so we generate we are starting to generate part of the money we would import, uh, import goods. So we want to concentrate there. We will never get 100%. I think if we can get 25%, that would be very good. So we are addressing that adequately. And the products are good. And uh, we are looking forward to even a brighter future in the coming years. Right, so back to section E where I was. Uh, so I had an NGO so that. So giving back to the society, section F. After you give it back to your society, we I'm a foundation founding member. A lot of us in the explosive we have about six, seven companies. And everybody is working independently. Everybody is working independently. We are competing. Sometimes it's fierce competition out of seven companies. Only seven companies at that time. So this started like, uh, what, 15, 18 years ago. I felt we should interrelate within ourselves. So I made proposals to the MDs of those companies that let us meet, even if it's two times a year, we meet and talk about our business and how we can minimize the fierce competition and animosity and all that and arguments and quarreling and ill feelings. You know, when people are competing, they generate some ill feelings. So we met, all the MDs came, and I was managing that association for, I think, up to 10 years. And then eventually we registered it. We registered that association. And uh, we have today what you call a Civil Explosive Dealers Association of Nigeria. I was the chairman, I was the founding chairman until about four, uh, four years ago when we elected somebody else. So that, to me, was, I think people in the profession will never forget that. That's a legacy that you need back. <laughs> now, with, with that, we interface, as, as the chairman too, we are interfacing with 
Office of the National Security Advisor because they give you licenses. The Nigerian Police EOD, my escort is from Abuja, from the Nigerian the Commissioner of Police. So anytime you are traveling anywhere, we give you escort. So I mean, I choose to take one person. So it's from, it's not just the normal police, it's from the explosive, the, the uh, ordnance, ordnance department, that's the people dealing, supervising explosives. So it's from there, we deal with Minister of Mines, the interfacing led to a review of the Explosive Act. So apart from the kind of nurturing the Civil Explosive Dealers Association, we interrelate with government and we try to review the Explosive Act. This Explosive Act is obsolete. So we brought in documents, we brought in what other countries are doing, things are changing, technology is changing, so we brought all that in, and we, we worked with all that. There was a committee of different units, custom, different, different people, different associations, and we all worked together and put up this, uh, this new act. So uh, in September 2021, the Explosives Act was passed by the Senate, awaiting the assent of the President. Any Nigerian knows that to pass anything through Senate, you have to lobby. You have to, you don't, they don't care what. They don't care what it is. When we met the minister, when we were doing that, he said he would put it, let it be sponsored by the ministry or by the president so that if they say it was sponsored by the Civil Explosive Dealers Association, it would, it would take a long time and we are going to spend a lot. So it was being sponsored by the ministry or something like that, so as to give it an official look. The people, senators will call you and tell you straight, if you want to pass this bill, come and see us. It's not, it, they say it openly. They're not afraid. There's nothing you can do. And I remember myself and my director, and three of us, we spearheaded all that discussion with the senators, uh, you know, we're in Nigeria, so we know what, what that means, you know. And uh, eventually we passed that. We passed that. So, uh, so I'm adding here that I played a critical role both in the formation of the Explosives Act and its passage into law. That's lesson 14. Now, what you may be doing your own bit, but these things are highly appreciated by government. They are highly appreciated by people. That you do, in fact, when I was the, the uh, president of Civil Explosives, other companies, my company had an advantage because we didn't break the law, but when you bend the law, and the government officials know it's legal, and they say, leave it. You know, they overlook it. Our brothers in the law will just, is it this guy who did this? Is it the guy that helped us to push? This is actual, you know that goodwill, that goodwill, but uh, they, they, they use it and it's, it's a, it offers you great advantage. So, so, and, uh, so I played a critical role in formation of the new Explosives Act and in formation of the, of the Civil Explosives Dealers Association. So, at this stage now, I give it back to my society and I give it back to the nation. And this has, there's no end to these things. I look forward to continuing to do this, to continue to give back to my society and to the nation. So we are now on Section G. Section G, the man Kassaya. Who am I? Of course, you know my foundation, but we look in a little bit deeper. You see that I say I'm married to former Miss Zore Eva Akase, now known as Mrs. Eva Kasara. And we are pleased with six children and many grandchildren. I also own a number of other companies, Sinadima Limited and Wajima. I'm currently on the board of Crystal Rock. Siladiba is actually my investment company. I use that to invest. 
I'm a well-traveled man. I've been all over the world, more or less. And uh, I remember that when we did the factory as an appreciation to my directors, uh, first we went to my ancestral roots. I took to David Abo and General Hila. We went there just to know how it looks. It's part of holiday. But I thought if we were very close and doing business together, we should know each other better. So I took them there. And when the factory started, I also took all my directors on a trip to China. And uh, uh, we, it, it helps. This kind of thing, all work and no play, make Jack the dog ball. And it helps. So I'm well traveled. Of course, the last one or two years, age is telling, and I can't travel much, but there's no regret, absolutely no regret. When you do things at the right time, you don't look back, you know, so. I was awarded with an honorary doctorate degree by the Commonwealth University. The picture on your left here captures that moment where I got my degree, and a number of people went, that's where I met Professor Gudu also. A number of people went, Mrs. Babu went, a number of people even in the hall went, uh, told him my brother and the rest, went with my wife. And uh, uh, I was also honored with the chimpanzee title, Baalura One, of Orile Ibore. In Ogo State, where my factory is established. So, um, um, the, even there, I play a role. Whatever I see, in fact, when the chief, when the KBSC, when I was doing my 17th birthday, he came with a powerful delegation. He came with a powerful delegation. When we sit in the meeting, I sit on the right. Even though I don't hear you, but one time they were trying to speak. Try to combine a lot of English. But I said, no, 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 speak in your Yoruba language. It's a traditional thing. I come with my PA, he sits by my side, speak your language. A few English words will come through. So I, I follow the story. And my boy quickly hits me the key thing, so I follow. So I play a role, and uh, uh, it's a good relationship. We're, we're not talking about the factory. The community in the factory is done by the company. The company, the whole community has changed. It's changed. We've done the roads, we supply supplied we put their lives for them, we brought paper, everything. Everything has changed that area. You know. So I'm a member of the prestigious country club in Kaja, with affiliates throughout the country. I'm the patron of my club in the Kaja, the one I'm more attached to because of the strong interpersonal relationship. I'm also a member of our distinguished Boko Club. I can see Boko Club members. President, what is good? I didn't see my president. The fellow of the Society of Mining Engineers and a respectful consultant in my field. I have a second picture here. My fellowship by the Society of Mining Engineers. I think all of you have gotten this now. Yeah, okay. While I was talking about my chieftaincy, I can, one or two of our brothers back in Lagos have asked me, ah, why have you not got the chieftaincy back home? And uh, I want to make it public that around when we were building our factory, I think that in uh, 2010, his Royal Highness Chief Azakwe offered me Chief Tassi title. I think he was doing 16 birthday or something like that. But I felt I've not finished my factory. You have to have something in you. You have to have some to, Chief Tassi titles are honorary, but they should mean something. They shouldn't just mean anything. If after I build my factory, you give me, I will collect. I'll be happy. But at this point, I've not finished, I've not done my factory, I'm in the middle of something. So I politely told him, 
I explained to him everything. I attended the function. I attended the function, but I, I declined. It. So I want to make it public that it has been offered to me. And uh, I want to also add that if my to one can honor me and by coming with that kind of powerful delegation, I take one is like the way he treated me when I popped in to pay homage on the on the second was absolutely amazing. These things matter more. You know, you can you can get a certificate for something and not make impact. But you can make impact and not even get that certificate. And this is more useful. The impact is more useful. So, and I want to believe that God's time is the best. We have plenty of time. Things are working. I can read body language of some people, so I do. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Uh, last on that paragraph, I'm involved in conflict resolution, uh, resolution and recognized by the United Nations as a mayor of peace. In view of my willingness and effort at peace initiative and charity activities, I want to state here that you can see a number of people from Chief Community Lagos, Zoo Chief are here, members of officials are here. When I was in Lagos, when, well, I'm still in Lagos many years ago, when I discovered that Zoo Chief had two fractions and they had issues between themselves deeply rooted issues. I was already close to one party. So I reached out to the second party and I, I talked to him nicely. I said, come, let's discuss and whatever, whatever. And the second party came. I remember in the first meeting, it was difficult. He even refused to sign. He was afraid he would. The second person was the officially officially recognized president of Nzuti. The other party was viewed as having majority people, but he was not in support. They were conflict. So I invited him both of them. First, I told my, my association, BAM. I told BAM. BAM said, okay, this is a major assignment, and they will, they will give me two people to support me in this peace initiative. I told them what I wanted to do. So they gave me uh, the current president, then he wasn't the president, Mr. Chika, and uh, Mr. Kako, Mr. Chris, Christopher Kako, to Odaka, Christopher Odaka, to work with me towards making peace. And this project took a long time. Eventually, after two, three meetings, the officially recognized person started to have confidence in me. He discovered later that um, he went to the same secondary school with me. In fact, he was born the year I finished. He was born in 1967, that's the year I finished secondary school. So he, he now started to have confidence and uh, we nurtured the two together towards achieving something, towards achieving some modalities for peaceful cooperation between them. So I think that all, all that will work together. And I think uh, Mr. Kwabo, uh, whom I call uh, President Kwabo, are you, are you in the hall? That's the, that's the gentleman. He is the immediate past president of Zouji. Today, even though there were some shakings on the way, what matters is not the root. What matters is the end result. There is a president of Ram, and I think the president of Zouji Lagos is also here. Are you here? Mm -hmm. President of the So, I look back and I'm happy that I played a role. Quite frankly, I didn't realize that it should have so much impact, but it did. 
and the way it looks at life is an important factor in one's reaction to issues. I just give you five of some of what I think, what I believe in. Right from youth, I dreaded being poor and unable to feed myself and family. I love the independence that financial stability provides. Right from you. I hated being dependent. So I loved it. So that helped to push me. If I'm doing something, I want to succeed. If I, I must, I want to succeed. If I'm arranging things in my room, even if I remember in the middle of the night that something is not somewhere, I'll get up and put it, I'll move the pen and put it there. Number two, I believe it is my responsibility and not my wife to feed myself, wife, children, and dependents. That's, that's a core belief for me. I believe as a man, it is my responsibility to feed my wife and take care of my family. Number three, I believe it is the responsibility of the woman, not man, to bring forth and nurture responsible children who will continue with the family legacy. That's my belief. Some may not, some may not believe 100%, but that's what I believe. I believe if I do not provide financial need for the family and dependents, then I have failed as a man. For me, love for my family is ability to meet their financial needs. Not what some people do these days, when they love their wife, they are holding their wife on the street, kissing their wife when you go to UK and all that. I don't do that. If I love you, you have a financial need, I'll take care of you. That is, that is my operation. All that helps in doing business. And let me add, let me add here. Success, if you believe in something, be prepared for sacrifice. I and my wife, 19, 1975, were in Joss. You know, Joss is a beautiful environment. The desire to succeed pushed me. I went to Lagos and left her irrespective. Our desire to succeed pushed me to UK. A lot of my mates in Joss ended up in Joss because, it, I mean, you know, they are comfortable. But something pushed you, and you have to be ready for sacrifice. And I remember one thing as my wife is smiling. When we had, after, when we had two children, or I used to sleep on the same bed with her and the two children in the bedroom. And the children would disturb, get up in the night, make noise, cry, she would get up, take care of them. But I wasn't getting quality sleep. And this is when we had our second child. So this is this is the one we had our third child before we had our first child before I went to UK. And when I came back, we had two children. So when we had the second one, so and we had a beautiful house. My house in the Lorry then had four bedrooms, and two of the bedrooms were not used. So I just told her I have to move to the other bedroom. I moved, put my things in the other bedroom. I let my wife take care of you. That is your responsibility. I can tell you she was not happy. She fought that for the last 15 years. In fact, it is when she started to see. Because when I moved there, I get my quality sleep. Later, when I became a businessman, I always sleep with pen and paper by my side. Because I'm a leader. I'm not just following something that has done. I'm a pathfinder. I'm, I'm opening the way. So the ideas come, and I just chuck them. 
I don't have any advisor. I don't have any boss. Others, I may be their boss. I may say, do this, this. But I am the one leading the way. So you have to be sensitive to ideas. You have to. So I'll keep my pen and paper. But of course, the last few years that I'm chairman with a reputable team, with directors doing, I've stopped doing that. But that is what I did to grow up. I put my ideas will come, I get up in the night and jump it so I don't forget the next day I do. So what I'm trying to say, to succeed, you should be prepared to sacrifice something. If you say you won't sacrifice, you can sacrifice your comfort. So it's so nice to be a judge. It's so nice to stay with your wife, sleep on the same bed with your wife. But for me, I found it, it was disturbing my business life. And I took the decision. And the last few years now, that my wife has seen what our efforts are. I'm sure she's happy with that decision. When, when, we, go, when we go to the UK, the normal room, normally people would say, so she wants her room. Now she's used to it. We were, she wants her independence. And I want her independence. Because at the end of the day, you are yourself first before any other thing, no matter how tight. Anyway, gentlemen, let's move forward. Section I, my advice. And these are some reflections about me. I tell my staff, always be on top of your job. In fact, when I'm talking to the material, always be on top of your job. Don't allow the job to be on your top. Always. Make that extra effort to be in control of what you are doing. And my advice here, if you have any, if you have excess workload, go over if you can to clear your backlog. Number two, be constantly conscious of your key desires. As a businessman, you should be conscious. Of it. You should be aware of what you want at all times. And I gave an example here. If two people are walking on the road and there is a dollar bill on the road, let's say, or let's say there's diamond, a piece of diamond or a bar of gold, and two people are walking, everybody wants success. But if you have read about gold, you know what a bar of gold looks like. You have read about it, you've researched. You are, like, you are cautious of what it looks like. If two of you are walking and there's a bar of gold on the road, who will see it first? The man that has read about it and is cautious of it. Of course, everybody wants to make progress. This other man too wants money. He wants to pick that gold. But he has not, he's not consciously aware. So be consciously aware of what you want and your objectives. Number three, to succeed, be hardworking, disciplined, and educated in that order. I add here that I'm assuming that one has basic sense, common sense, primary school, basic common sense. I've seen many millionaires who are not educated, and they've been very successful, even in the industry. I can give an example of Aladio Oladi Meiji, right? Who can move mountains? He's rich, comfortable in lorry. He literally controls the lorry. You know. So the key here: hardworking, discipline. Of course, and their education. Discipline is very important. In anything you want to do, you must be disciplined. Just recently, after a board meeting, I was talking to somebody about the project that I wanted to do. And the person felt that, ah, at this age, what are you doing? You need to do a project. Why do you worry at this your age? God has blessed you and the rest. I said that. And I gave him an analogy which I uh, highlighted here. If one plants a, a tree, you plant a tree, the, you nurture it, you see the tree grow gradually. You get up every day, you look at the tree. You see the flowers. 
some weaving, the aroma of the flowers. And then eventually you see the fruits. I'm assuming that the fruits now is the money, the financial. I'm telling him that, and then I get two analogies. You that planted the tree, when you see it doing all that, you will enjoy it more than the other man who did not plant it, but is just picking the fruits. Am I correct? Because you are seeing the, your, the, 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 the fruits of your labor. As the tree is growing, oh, you are appreciating it. When the flowers come out, oh wow, beautiful flowers. The fruits will be your secondary objective. In fact, the fruits may not be your objective. Because you reach a certain level of comfort that money multiplies itself. So you can go back and sleep. But nobody with a talent, nobody with a talent will think of something and avoid doing it just because he feels it's comfortable. So, so, so what you enjoy is the expression of that talent, the practical utilization of that talent to see something productive and physical. physical. So that's, that. that's number four. And my fifth talk, I said here, why it is good for females to be engaged? Let powers and consider the following two scenarios. Family A and B. We take family A. Family A has a wife, husband and wife. Both are working. Family B has father working, mother at home taking care of the children. Okay, family A, father and mother working. Family B, father is working, mother is at home taking care of the children. When they pass on, the store card of family A is that because both of them are working, they need 100 units of money. 100 units of money. But the mother was not at home taking care of the children. The children are half as disciplined as family B. In family B, they left 50 units of money. But the children are more disciplined than in family A. Two times double more disciplined than family A. Which family do you think stands a chance of being successful in the long term? <laughs> family B. Let's think about that. I'm not saying both spouses should not work, but I see a much craze for everybody working and the children are abandoned in our society. We should think about that. I think God actually did create it that way, but our society has created it that way. So that's food for thought for you. Gentlemen, I'm moving on. Thank you all very much. I'll move on. But before I close, I want to acknowledge and appreciate. So page 12, that's section J. I wish to acknowledge and sincerely appreciate all who have contributed one way or the other to my journey through life. For the purpose of this lecture, it is grace to grace. What has got people to see, to feel that I'm in the grace sector is by a company called Nigake. And that's why I'm highlighting Nigake. For the purpose of this lecture, I want to appreciate my, the first honorary chairman of Nikake is Air Vice Marshal Clement Uka, retired. When I went to Lagos, when you want to succeed, sometimes you look for people who are there to, to mentor you. So I invited him, and he was too happy. Here is a big man, very, very big man, members of Amphosis Ruling Council. In fact, when you when is that time they were developing Abuja, he will come to my house, my wife is there, he will come to my house, he will just hold me by the hand, he used to have a walking stick. He will go to, he doesn't go to normal airport, he will go to presidential wing, he will just sit there, which, which dignitary is flying? Whoever is flying, what time? We may start with Abu Salami. 
with me, you just carry me, I will go. You know, and uh, if, for such a man to agree to be my chairman was a big honor to me. I want to appreciate him in this journey. <laughs> and the succeeding chairman, after him, because he did very well, General John Aguila was also a chairman, General, we appreciate you. And then uh, I took over from the Dilemma in 1994 when I met, when I had retired from my company. Earlier, I was still working in the CFPL, so I did it all that. After his two ten him, I also acknowledge and appreciate the fully executive and non executive directors. In the first picture is the group MD of Sona. He is the son of the owner of Sona. The Sona Group is one of the richest companies in India. His father is the 70th, 70 richest person in India, which net worth last year was accessed at over $2 billion from the father who is the one who owns all that. And even him started from grass. Even him did inherit. The father did inherit. In fact, the early days, sometimes he used to sleep in the car. The car he was driving. That's the group chairman of my company, Nika Capital General Limited. So the son is the group MD. And he came that deep. He doesn't come here. Maybe every two, three years he comes. He came 2012. And this picture, this down one, is the board of directors last month. We took it on Thursday when we had our board meeting. Chief Abo is not here because he was connected by Zoom, so they were not here. So I appreciate all of you, <coughs> including the board members and directors. I appreciate all AGMs, HODs, senior staff, junior staff, factory workers. I appreciate each and every one of the 350 people that make up the great Nigger Camp team. Now to the last page. Perhaps even before others, I appreciate my partner in this journey. I'm referring to my wife Eva. I may not have involved her directly in all in some matters, but I certainly share the high and low moments with her and her subtle inputs at those critical times helped a lot in my decision making. Very important. I don't think about my family too much, but quite frankly, when things are very good, I tell her. When things are very low, I tell her. And sometimes she just advise, why don't we do it like this? Why don't we do it like this? Play the role directly or indirectly, I appreciate them all. Finally, I give glory to God Almighty for everything. May He May his will continue to be done in my life and the company. May his blessings come upon all of us in this chapel. Benue State, Benue is a poor state. May the Almighty raise many businessmen to uplift our society. Uh, I want to thank you all for listening and God bless all of you.